A few months ago, I went to the opera. Bizet's Carmen, to be exact. In the first scene, when Carmen saunters out and seduces about 30 soldiers with one pout, she sings, Love is a gypsy child, a gypsy child that knows no law. All the poets and philosophers down the ages would agree and sing the chorus right along with her. After all, everybody knows that romantic love is mysterious, irrational, fleeting, something we just fall into and then fall out of. But this leaves us with a big problem. We now depend on romantic partners more and more for the support and social connection we need. Most of us don't live in villages anymore. If we're lucky, we live in a community of two. And more and more of us complain of chronic loneliness. And for the first time in human history, the basic unit of society, the family, is founded almost solely on feelings of love and affection. Building these precious, indispensable relationships on a shadow, a mystery that is so out of our control, seems just a little bit risky. Maybe this is why, in my part of the world, the biggest question on Google last year was, what is love? And also, how do you do it? But it's okay, because in fact, Bizet and his lawless version of love is out of date. We now know that love makes sense, and we can not only make sense of it, we can shape it. This is a breakthrough. This is a big idea, a paradigm shift, a revolution. How did this happen? Well, beginning in the 1990s, social scientists began systematically observing couples doing what all couples do, fighting, making up, saying goodbye, asking for caring, facing scary situations together. Researchers like myself have been busy coding the expressions on people's faces, pinpointing the exact responses that shift a relationship from despair to delight, putting partners in brain scanners, measuring their hormones. Science has at last focused on the dramas that make up our everyday emotional lives, pinpointing, for example, why hurt feelings preoccupy us and what makes for an effective apology. In my lab, we have successfully studied how to help couples not just increase their relationship satisfaction, but create the loving responsiveness that truly repairs their emotional bond. Well, hold on though. We can improve communication, but can we really, in therapy, create love and trust in a therapy session? 20 years of research says we can, but only if we know how to make sense of love, only if we grasp the laws of love. Let's look at four of them. Each one is supported by many research studies. Number one, in essence, romantic love is a grown-up version of the emotional bond between mother and child with the same megawatt emotions, driving longing for closeness and connection, need for safe haven, safety and connection, the safety and connection that lessens fear and stress the same emotional turmoil at the threat of loss and separation, and the same three strategies and moves for dealing with our need to be close. Let's be clear, this bond with parents and then with lovers is no small matter. It is an ancient survival code wired into our brains when we were born, small and helpless. If we call and no one comes, this is terrifying. We know that isolation, being cut off from the care of others, is the ultimate danger signal. It can render us helpless. It can kill. A study by House 
finds that emotional isolation is more dangerous for your health than smoking or lack of exercise. And you are three times more likely to have a stroke or a heart attack if you have to face the world alone. We are recognizing that we are born to connect. It is our deepest instinct, more powerful than sex or aggression. What is the first law of love? It is that it is a survival code and regulates our sense of safety or danger. The template for the way we love is the bond with our first caregiver. As an adult, this bond is different in that we don't need our lovers physically present all the time. We can turn to them in our minds and use them as safety cues to calm us. When I fly, as the plane takes off, I listen to my husband's loving voice in my head and my heart stabilizes even though we are climbing to 39,000 feet. If you want to think about this in terms of a drug, thinking of my husband lightly turns on a bonding hormone called oxytocin in my brain and this turns off fear. That's clever. Law number two. Not so long ago, the belief was that mothers should not hold children because it made them into dependent wimps. In fact, we now know that it makes them stronger, more confident. But many of us still believe that we should not need our partners, that it is a weakness to depend on others. Law number two says that our need for others to be available and respond to us like we matter, is wired into our mammalian brain. So if you're listening and you're a lizard, this talk isn't for you. Our ability to reach for others and use them as a resource to calm us, to comfort us and support us is a strength. In fact, it is probably the greatest strength of our species. The strongest and most resilient of us know how to turn to others as a resource. After 9-11, the folks who lived around the towers who could turn to others recovered just fine. Not so those who tried to deal with that trauma alone. Widows who know they were loved recover best from the loss of their partner. Love makes us stronger. Law number two, we're better together. Loving and being loved makes you stronger. Law number three, tells us what the essence of a good love relationship is. It is where the answer to the question, are you there for me emotionally, is yes, you can count on me to respond. Master lovers know how to reach for each other, pull each other close, and repair moments of disconnection and hurt. A love relationship is a constant dance of mutual tuning in, moments of meeting, miscues and misses, failures and hurts, repair, and then falling into loving connection again. Master lovers create a safe haven for each other. They literally bring each other's heart rate down, reduce each other's stress hormones. We watch couples in our lab repair their relationship after years of distress. They have a hold me tight conversation where each partner can share vulnerabilities and needs in a way that helps the other person come close and respond. Emotional responsiveness is the key to secure bonding. Over nine studies, these conversations transformed relationships and predicted successful relationship repair after therapy and years later. Partners who have this safe emotional connection have better sex, by the way. It's emotional safety not constant novelty that is the key to great sex. When you are safe, you can play. So law number three is emotional attunement and responsiveness are the key to safe haven bonding. Both partners can reach and respond. Law number four. The dance of love is really not that complicated there are only three predictable key moves. Whether you are five or 55, 
when you feel disconnected, the natural tendency is to try to reach for your loved one, especially if you've had this work for you in the past. Sometimes these reaches are a little shy and a little sly, as in, if you're not busy, you could help me make the coffee. If the reconnection doesn't happen, we just have two other strategies to deal with our longings and our fears. You will protest to get a response. You might get angry or demanding, as in, you never help me make the coffee. If connection has been a place of constant disappointment for you, the only solution is to shut down and numb out your feelings, as in, I'm going for coffee, see you later. We tell distressed couples the normal dance of disconnection is where one is pushing for a response but in an angry way that freaks out the other while the other feels helpless and steps back to avoid hurt. The same emotional music of abandonment and rejection is playing for both. Connection is so critical to our survival that criticism from our lover is coded in the same way and in the same place in the brain as physical pain. Both are danger signals. Chronic conflict in relationships is all about loneliness and disconnection that partners do not know how to bridge. The couples I just described are not really fighting about coffee. Once couples get that both of them are alone and afraid, they can comfort each other in the storm and find their way home. Law number four. The moves that make up the dance of bonding are reaching and responding, pushing and demanding, or turning away to numb out hurt and longing. So we know what love is. We know why it matters, what it does for us and what responses make or break our love relationships. This quiet revolution has all happened in the last 20 years. But can love last? The evidence is that if you know how to do it, it can. Brain scans tell us that some long-term lovers' brains respond in the same way with the same excitement as those of new lovers to pictures of their beloved. If you can reach out and hold on to each other as you face life's dragons together, every dragon you face makes the bond of trust and love between you stronger. We can have the loving, lasting relationships we all long for, but only if we learn love sense. We have solved the mystery called love and we can learn to shape it this is the doorway into greater happiness, better mental and physical health, more secure, resilient and confident adults and more loving partnerships and families. Let's use science to make more and more of our lives start like this and move towards this.